hundreds of the um, the contributors of the book. And uh, I'm just going to won't take up too much time, but give a, a bit of a brief story of why uh, I'm involved in royal commissions. Uh, some people collect stamps, I collect royal commissions. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now, why did this obsession begin? And it has become an obsession. Uh, some years ago, when I was at the University of Queensland, back in 1973-74, um, studying under Ken Wilshire, uh, I somehow got selected or nominated or volunteered to go and work for a Royal Commission in Canberra. This was the Coombs Royal Commission to Australian Government Administration, uh, set up by the Whitlam Government. And I was flown down in business class, uh, very impressive, uh, from my boy from Ipswich. I was met at the airport by a Ford LTD car, chauffeur-driven car, uh, and I thought, this is the life, honestly, um, I think. And I came to Canberra, which I thought the oddest place in the world, uh, because they had made a lake and built a bridge across it. And where I come from, this, which we've been trying to build a bridge across the Bremen River for about five years. Um, and so I found this very odd, but I worked at Mineral House, symbolically, where the Royal Commission research team was, and I met Nugget Coombs, Peter Walensky, Paul Munro, Professor Eden Campbell, um, Jeffrey Hawker was the head of research. Everyone was exceptionally kind. And I know you've all read the five volumes of the, of the Royal Commission to Australian Government Administration. And in uh, Appendix 5, you'll see my name, Scott uh, <laughs> Patler, and so on. Obviously very influential in the outcome of, of, the, of the process. So that triggered the big $64 question in a sense. Why would you have a Royal Commission into the public service in Canberra land, which is what I call Canberra land, which is a bit like Santa land. Um, and I thought this, this is a very strange thing. And when I was talking there, one of the uh, more senior public servants said to me, well, Scotty, if you want to be an academic, you've got to pick some niche to be an academic in so that you can always specialise Try and pick something that no one's interested in, that way no one can question you uh, or, 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 or prove that you're wrong. So he said, why don't you pick Royal Commissions and Inquiries? And that's what happened. And the rest of the say is, is history. Royal Commissions um, in, in Australia have had a phenomenally big influence. Um, and it's very interesting that the 12th Act of the new Commonwealth Parliament was the Royal Commissions Act. Um, and what happened, and I think this is very symbolic of uh, the whole story of Royal Commissions, is that uh, a, a number of soldiers coming back on a, on a ship from the Boer War, as you know, Australia states sent troops off to the Boer War to fight for the Empire. Uh, 16 or 17 of them died on the ship. There was a huge public outcry. Uh, by this time, the Commonwealth Government had come into being. Defence was a Commonwealth responsibility. So they said, let's have a Royal Commission. So the Governor General duly released the letters patent for the Royal Commission. And then they realized that there was a Royal Commission that had no power. Problem. So they hasty colonies have been setting up some Royal Commissions. So they copied the New South Wales Royal Commission Act, which was eight paragraphs. Alfred Deakin rushed it in through Parliament, who was the Attorney General. And that's how we got the Royal Commission Act 902. Okay. Uh, and that was the beginning of Royal Commissions. And which since, since 901, we've had 139 Commonwealth Royal Commissions. Uh, there are three Royal Commissions presently going at the moment. The one into veteran suicide, the one into disability services, and the one into robo-death. So three ongoing Royal Commissions at this very moment. Um, and so, so people often ask me, uh, well, Scott, what are some interesting Royal Commissions? And can I just forewarn, I'm not in the camp that believes Royal Commissions are you know, a waste of time, they've all been rigged and so on. There's certainly uh, some questionable ones. There's a couple of Royal Commissions I think everyone should know something about. The one which fascinated me was the 1908 Royal Commission into Australian Postal Services. I'm sure you've all read it. Uh, as you know, postal services were run by the states or the colonies prior to federation. One of the things in the constitution, the Commonwealth took over postal services. It was apparently a shambles. Uh, so they set up a Royal Commission. And they went all over Australia. Uh, they talked to uh, the people who handled 
you know, telephone exchanges, postal services, and so on, and this thing. The most exciting thing about this Royal Commission, which is a good one, was they interviewed Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, who came from America to talk to the Royal Commission. He was in America, he was a Scotsman, of course. Um, he was in America setting up ITT um, for the family. Um, and he came and gave evidence to the Royal Commission. And he said, we're just beginning, we're just beginning the communications revolution, mm -hmm. right? And he said, one day you'll be able to make telephone calls and talk to the people and see them at the same time, right? He also said, look, if you're going to run a postal service, employ more women, they're usually more efficient, um, and make sure you pay people properly. Uh, so for a Scotsman, I thought that was quite impressive. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> The other Royal Commission which I like to post on, which is also in the past, is the 1925 Royal Commission to Health. And this is rather relevant to what's happening at the moment. As you all know, the Commonwealth, when the pandemic broke out in 1918-1919, the Commonwealth only had powers on quarantine. Uh, we had a Chief Quarantine Officer, wait for his name, John Howard Cumston, okay, <laughs> who was a doctor who was a, an internationally recognised doctor, who did things for the Rockefeller Institute and so on. And we had several things happening at that time. We had the pandemic, 15,000 Australians died. We had soldiers coming back from World War I. Remember, Australia lost more troops in World War I than the United States. We only had a population of 4.4 million. Uh, they had all the problems of being wounded, plus sexually transmitted diseases, okay, was a big problem, okay. And uh, Dr. Cumson uh, uh, convinced Billy Hughes, the Labor Prime Minister who became a Nationalist Prime Minister, to set up the Commonwealth Department of Health in 1921. It has no, had no constitutional power whatsoever. And uh, Dr. Cumston became the head of the Department of Health. Now, as you know, or may not know, in 1922, there was an election the country party was emerging uh, and they said uh, they'll, they'll, they'll support the Nationalist Party but you've got to get rid of Billy Hughes. So the Nationalist Party got rid of Billy Hughes and put in um, Stanley Bruce as Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Cumston, Dr. Cumston got to see, see Stanley Bruce and said, no, there should be a Royal Commission to help, no. And a couple of things happened. The Deputy Prime Minister, country party, was Dr. Earl Page. The Minister for Health was a doctor who had served in World War I on the trenches and had got a Victoria Cross. Okay, so you've got a, a congruence of things of medical people being involved. And uh, uh, Dr. Cumston convinced Bruce to call a meeting of federal state ministers and premiers and so on and to see how much cooperation he could get from the states. Guess how much cooperation he got? <laughs> None whatsoever. So, um, so Dr. Cumps said, you've got to have a Royal Commission because there's so many things happening about um, maternal health, children's health, sexually transmitted disease, preventive health, tropical health, and so on. He wrote the terms of reference. All the people on the Royal Commission were doctors. Stanley Bruce insisted that there be a woman doctor on the Royal Commission the first woman appointed to a Royal Commission, uh, uh, who was from Victoria, who seemed to be on every board and committee you possibly could be uh, in health issues. And this Royal Commission uh, met all over Australia, and it produced a fantastic report about the importance of data collection, uh, how to improve maternal health, how to, it, it pr pr promoted the first advertisements on Victorian railway systems about symptoms of VD um, and so on. And because um, Dr. Cumston was the head of the health department, which he held till 1941, by the way, uh, 20 years, uh, unlike the heads of the government departments these days who lucky the last three years, um, he was able to implement some of those implementations. And by the way, he was a witness to the Royal Commission and he wrote the questions to ask him uh, for the Royal Commissioner. So, 
And as you say, uh, there's a couple of examples of Royal Commissions which have been um, really important, if you like. Um, so, Royal Commissions have had a major impact on Australian politics and also public inquiries, which are uh, a, a less stringent form of inquiry, have had major impacts. The Campbell Inquiry into financial deregulation, which has saved Australia uh, from financial ruin, was a really important thing, set up by John Howard, um, but not implemented by Malcolm Fraser, actually implemented by Mr Keating and co. So really important sort of, sort of bodies. Uh, there's the Gonski uh, public inquiry, which I regard as one of the worst inquiries. Um, um, Hammond, but it, it became the language of, of, of debate. Give Gonski a go and so on um, and so forth. So lots and lots of inquiries. And we've had quite a few inquiries uh, undergoing in Queensland in the last couple of years, um, which everyone knows about. So um, without further ado, I thought we'd introduce our, uh, our main speaker, Margaret White. And I've got something to admit about Margaret White. Um, when I was a young law student in 1972, which I know is the previous century uh, and so on, uh, I was doing law. I was doing law because my father was a builder and a real estate agent, as well as running a fish and chip shop. And he thought having a lawyer in the family would be a really great for the Prasuk, Prasuk business. So I was duly enrolled in doing law. And I went along to the uh, law office and they had in those days, pieces of paper, you know, people wrote on pieces of paper, uh, all the different tutors. Uh, and there up on the, on, the, on the board was Mrs. White, tutor. And I thought, well, she's probably some old biddy. Okay. <laughs> uh, she'd be a bit of a walkover, you know. Uh, and then I went to the tutor, and Mrs. White wasn't uh, an old biddy. And, um, and I didn't really follow the tutes for quite some time. <laughs> okay, Margaret White has had um, a fantastic career um, that I've just, I really just discovered that she comes from Victoria originally. Uh, so, and, and, and worse, she was educated, apparently, a lot of the time, in a place called Adelaide. And having worked for two Adelaide people, um, I thought this was very interesting. Now, she got to Queensland uh, and became senior tutor, as you've just heard, at the law faculty and le lecturer, um, and became barrister in uh, 1978, and then moved on to Supreme Court, first woman to be appointed to the Supreme Court in Queensland, and then later to the Court of Appeal. Uh, she has a, a whole range of military connections, uh, by the way, uh, which is hard to do with um, her husband and but also her own interests. Uh, so quite amazing. She's awarded the Centenary Medal in 2003, um, Order of Australia in 2013. And what's wonderful about Mrs. White is she's actually chaired three commissions of inquiry. Uh, one into uh, racing, as a Presbyterian I was totally opposed. Um, uh, one into Northern Territory detention, um, which I met her during that time. And I thought the last one she's been a member of is the one in New Guinea, which I have to read out to you because it's uh, too hard to explain. The Royal Commission inquiry into processes and procedures followed by the government of Papua New Guinea into obtaining the offshore loan from the Union Bank of Switzerland and related transactions. Uh, and New Guinea, I think, uses the Queensland Commission to Inquiry Act, if I'm correct, as their yeah, basis so. sort of thing. So there's a, a really interesting connection uh, there between New Guinea and Royal Commission. So without further ado, um, we'll ask Margaret to come up and we'll then have the panel talk about the different chapters of the book. Okay, Margaret, over to you. Well, thank, thanks very much, Scott. What he politely didn't mention, of course, was that while I was in the sheltered workshop at the university, uh, I was able to have all my children and continue teaching, so probably most of the time I was vastly pregnant. <laughs> and I certainly recall well, one uh, rather conservative professor meeting me, uh, wafting down the corridor in full flight, 
And he said nervously, when, when is your baby due? And I said, it was due last week. <laughs> <laughs> he scuttled off. <laughs> he could well imagine one might. Um, and I think I've had the pleasure of meeting Scott more recently when he was Chief of Staff to Senator Birmingham. Senior advisor. Senior advisor, sorry. Didn't quite get that right. I never really can work out all those people that come around with, with ministers. But uh, when I was and still am uh, chair of the Queensland Catholic Education Commission, so I'm very pleased that you've invited me to launch um, this wonderful book, Scott. I must say that the things that I've, I've always enjoyed, the things that I've done, uh, but doing those commission, royal commissions and commissions of inquiry uh, after my retirement, you know, statutory senility, we actually are required to go at a particular age, which I shan't mention, if you know it, well, you know that I'm on the cusp of something interesting. And, uh, and so they've been just extraordinarily interesting things to do. Um, and given me a whole new look at Australia, if you like. And while I'm not a Presbyterian, um, nonetheless, I'm rather against gambling and racing. And so when the Attorney General rang me just before I retired from the court and said, well, wonder if you would uh, do this inquiry for us into the racing industry. I said, I think I should tell you, Attorney, that I know absolutely nothing about racing. Uh, I've only been to the races two or three times in my entire life. And he said, that's why I'm asking you. <laughs> because when I went into my news agent shop, and you know, all these things get into the, hit the press, uh, the proprietor said to me, oh, I see you're doing the uh, racing inquiry. I said, oh, yes, yes, have got an interest in racing. Oh, yes, he said, I only have the horses. And uh, he said, do you know anything about it? I said, not a thing. He said, I've got a good book for you. I said, oh. Thank you. What's it called? He said, fixed. <laughs> <laughs> I told you all you need for that. So let me say it more formally that I'm honoured to be uh, asked to launch this important uh, collection of essays on Royal Commissions and Public Inquiry. Scott has threaded what I call these small jewels full of sparkle and depth on a rope of gold. Now that's as, as poetic as we're going to get this morning. <laughs> He's written an introductory essay to each of the four thematic sections and with a concluding flourish, a class of the lectures, if you like, he has answered the question in the title, Do We Need Them? Well, at my first meeting with the Racing Inquiry's Executive Director, she said very firmly, well, we'll need a couple of copies of Presser. Indeed we did, because we were a very inexperienced team so far as public inquiries were concerned. So Scott's work, Royal Commissions and Public Inquiries in Australia was pretty dog-eared by the time we had completed our task. And the second edition is released in 2021. Mm -hmm. And I think it will be in as much demand as that first edition. But of course, that is not this book, which is also a bit doggy because I read it in February when I was going to New Zealand uh, for a wedding. Uh, so it was wonderful reading all the way over and all the way back. And I had read it cover to cover because I didn't take anything else to read. Now, since that much needed practical manual was first published in 2006, the use of Royal Commissions and Public Inquiries as an adjunct of government seems to have grown rather like compound interest. A modern assessment of their value to our Westminster democratic system is well overdue, as well as a look at how other countries are managing these things. And that's what this book sets out to do, and it has done it really very well. But in case those amongst us with shorter memories than others think this political reliance on independent public inquiries is a relatively recent phenomenon, a scroll through the excellent Commonwealth Parliamentary Library's list of royal commissions since Federation is a fairly fascinating exercise. And I know in your new edition, you've got a list of those uh, royal commissions. Um, that there were uh, inquiries into matters of fundamental policy is really understandable for a nation taking its first steps into government with an express set of subject matter powers. You would expect them to want to find out what 
what they should uh, be intending. The parliamentary, the um, constitutional convention debates um, talked about power, but they didn't really go down to the kind of depth that would have been needed. As Scott has already mentioned, the, the very first uh, Royal Commission was a practical one into a scandal, how surprising is that, about the death of the soldiers being brought back from the Boer War. But the second seems eminently sweeping in character, being one to consider sites for the seat of government in, for the Commonwealth. Many years ago, I was at a judges conference in Melbourne in January, and part of that's when the Federal and Supreme Court judges meet and tell each other how clever they are. And we were going to a reception up the Yarra in the suburb of Hawthorne. It was a beautiful evening, we were on a boat. And I could hear two women speaking behind me. They were the wives of two judges. And we said, well, we've shown Sydney, haven't we? Oh, no warnings. And uh, the other one said, oh, yes, we did. We did the UN in Melbourne. And then uh, uh, the other one said, well, of course, so they've never get, got over the fact that they weren't the seat of government. I turned around and I said, do you think Sydney even knows that Melbourne was the headquarters of the Commonwealth for 27 years? They looked a bit shocked, as if, as if Sydney ciders could care in the slightest bit about things like that. Well, in any event, the, uh, the overview of the history of public inquiries in the introductory part of, of Scott's essay, I found absolutely fascinating. I know a bit of, about a lot of the other things, but this was new to me. And uh, the, the origin in the Tudor times uh, of inquiries through the older British colonies and dominions uh, into our own colonial governments uh, here in Australia and the trends that they emerged in the decades before the Second World War, I thought were very interesting. Now, I might have thought before I read that chapter and followed up in the, uh, um, the parliamentary library uh, list that there would have been very few in the old days. But that's not so. Scott has helpfully added up the Royal Commissions. And uh, I'm going to give you the numbers because I think they're very revealing and say something about the history of our country. Uh, there were 54 from 1910 to 1929. There were 12 from 29 to 40. And I suppose the Depression might have had uh, an effect on that because uh, they couldn't be seen to be spending money on things like Royal Commissions in those straitened times. There were five only from 1940 to 1949, no doubt due to the war and its aftermath, other things to do. From 49 to 72, there were only seven Royal Commissions established. And it says something about society during that period that they included the Petrov Royal Commission. How vividly I remember that. I was in a politics tutorial class with David Coon, so I followed that with some interest. Um, and we debated those issues in our tutorials to three very interesting times. Well, that was deep, of course, in the Cold War. The two Voyager inquiries, um, which played out over decades and really ripped the legal establishment apart uh, and, uh, and a lot of administrative figures as well in the Commonwealth. Um, that's, that's a very interesting Royal Commission to, or two of them, to revisit actually, Scott. Um, and of course, that went on to, how long did it take the, comp the Commonwealth to give compensation to those sailors who survived terribly damaged? Terribly, shockingly long time. And then there were inquiries into television, should we have it? And the Great Barrier Reef, should we save it? There were, however, lots of non-statutory policy inquiries which set the Commonwealth on its important engagement with education, with the Martin Report and so on. Um, and as Scott has pointed out, the watershed in modern times and the use of public inquiries occurred under the Whitlam government. Over its short three-year life, there were 13 royal commissions and 73 non-statutory inquiries, largely policy uh, related. So despite attacks by the opposition during this period that had undermined the, the, the uh, public service and their role in government, the huge cost to the taxpayer when they were returned to office in 1975, over nearly 20 years, the coalition 
uh, appointed eight royal commissions and 84 other public inquiries. Or not to be outdone, the Hawke Keating government appointed 12 royal commissions and 189 public inquiries over 13 years, while the Howard Coalition during its 11 years managed four royal commissions and 84 public inquiries. So, you know, it's a rich source of information to read those reports that are available. And I think that they're under-recognised for that very reason. I think you would probably agree with me. Um, so this brings us to the more recent past, the period 2007 to 2013, the Rudd-Gillard governments, uh, governments. They largely eschewed royal commissions, although they had very many public inquiries relating to policy matters. But the one royal commission that was established was the 2013 Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. And that was established jointly with all the states and territories and I would suggest that that inquiry was amongst the most important in the history of public inquiries in this country and set the architecture for other similar inquiries with a large social policy remit. So the Continuing Disability Royal Commission, the Aged Care Royal Commission, the Banking Royal Commission and the also Continuing Defence Suicides Royal Commission they followed that architecture and it was the model that Mick Gooder and I used in the Royal Commission into Child Protection and Youth Justice in the Northern Territory. That is, allowing people to share their own dismal and unhappy experiences of institutions and organs of government, some in public and some in private sessions. It was very cathartic for those people and it was, for the first time, being listened to respectfully. So although fundamentally inquisitorial, um, these more recent uh, inquiries have produced important policy recommendations, many of which were unlikely to have emerged from internal policy development, whether in the states, territories or in the Commonwealth. I think you'll find fascinating the analysis by David Lee of the Royal Commissions of the Bruce Page Government from 1923 to 1929 on topics such as the basic wage and child endowment, which became eventually the cornerstone of Australia's social and economic policies. Now, don't roll your eyes, but Paul Tilley's contribution on Australian tax inquiries and their value is a page turner, I promise you. It's easy for the non-specialist to read, shorn as it is of jargon, while the broad overview of more than a century of thinking about tax really is masterly. I, I found it a terrific read. I can't say that about tax very often. <laughs> <laughs> the second section in the book uses some case studies to demonstrate the inquiry process and you're going to hear shortly from some of the authors so I'm not going to enter into their, their topics. But these essays are an important adjunct to Scott's other work, which I've already lauded greatly. I think that, that section particularly would be useful to read in conjunction with your second edition. As is noted by several of the authors in this section of the book, the character, personality and professional background of the person appointed to lead a royal commission or other public inquiry is fundamental to its outcomes. This is particularly so where policy recommendations are to be made. It's now expected that evidence will inform policy. So what evidence is sought by an inquiry and how it's characterised will be important decisions for the commissioner and senior staff. Two individuals could take quite different approaches to this question, yet still be within the terms of reference. And we are now quite familiar with the media making at least some commissioners into mostly reluctant celebrities, following their every frown and intervention. While Rowena Dorr, senior counsel assisting the Banking Royal Commission, was elevated to rock star status, as you will recall. The media like public inquiries. They also like defamation litigation. They do the work for the journalists. It's, it's, it's lazy reporting. Uh, and it's very rare that it actually adds anything to what they heard. The media rarely fail to promote 
a call for a royal commission, you might have noticed, for that very reason. The only one that some sections of the media seem to be lukewarm about was Mr Rudd's desire for a royal commission into the Murdoch press. <laughs> <laughs> well, I found Sue Regan's analysis of the uses of evidence in public inquiries in her essay in this section to be absorbing but quite challenging given that I had conducted three such inquiries and uh, it's quite different from being a judge in a trial where everything is brought to the court in our system there'll be no investigation and we'll play with what what toys we're given um, by by the lawyers and uh, the fact that one were to a large extent limited by only by the terms of reference was quite daunting so i think that there needs to be some more thought given to that very interesting um, issue of just how much the choice of the commissioner and senior counsel and solicitors assisting um, shape the commission and its outcomes. Can I mention then the third section? It covers a vital uh, area. How to assess if an inquiry has been a success? What does success look like? And I think you are going to be, be looking at that. There are important contributions in this section. For those who've been able to speak publicly of their or their family member's negative experience of a system such as RoboDebt or an institution such as the church or a department of government such as defence, that in itself might be the measure of success. But without lasting change, as the writers point out, such success might be counted as relatively meagre. So the five the essays in this section cover a lot of ground, but I was struck by a comment by Robert Carling in his discussion of the fiscal implications of inquiries that recommend fixing a problem by the allocation of large sums from the tax purse. Not all commissioners think that money solves all problems. When Mick Gooder and I reported informally to the Prime Minister and Attorney General in 2017, before handing the final report on the Northern Territory Child Protection and Youth Justice Systems to the Governor-General and then to the Chief Minister. Mr Turnbull said rather dryly, I suppose you're asking for a great deal of money to fix the problems in the Northern Territory. Mick responded, no, there's actually adequate funds flowing into the Northern Territory. It was just particularly poorly directed and largely unaccounted for. And this was not well accepted by the Prime Minister or the Attorney General, I can tell you, they were quite offended. But it was shocking to us the way the Commonwealth literally threw its money and didn't require anything in return by way of accountability into that territory. Mr Carling opines that a commissioner's role ends when the report is done and handed to the appointing government. Thereafter, a commissioner ought not engage in public comment or advocacy. I think that's a good point. I don't think it was a question that I have ever considered as a commissioner entering into a commission, and it didn't really arise in the Racing Royal Commission, um, but it did from the Northern Territory Royal Commission, because the media badgered Mick and me every time there was something newsworthy to do with youth justice occurring in the Northern Territory. What did we think? How did we feel? We took the view that everything we had to say was in the report. I think that's the safe course uh, and as the years have passed when the ABC reporter up there leaves a message on my phone I don't even bother to respond anymore but rather unusually I think in that case the office established in the Department of Territory Families chain um, that was charged with implementing our recommendation used to report to to us uh, every now and then about how their progress was going and in fact um, after 12 months, the departmental secretary, Ken Davies, and the person in charge of the change office actually came down to Brisbane and spent half a day explaining all these things to us. And we were quite gratified about that. It was a very pleasant thing to do. So sometimes the impact of a Royal Commission plays out over a long period and has profound effects on major organisations in our country. As I've mentioned, the response to the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse has deeply affected how schools 
supporting bodies and churches manage their relationships with children in their care and I think everyone will agree has led to significant worthwhile change in all of those areas and God willing we won't ever go back to those terrible times again there will be enough people brave enough to speak up and there will be processes in place so the final section in this excellent publication is devoted to the experiences of public inquiries in other countries, the UK, New Zealand, presidential commissions in the United States and the Nordic countries. I did find the latter discussion particularly interesting based on a more immediate kind of participatory democracy in developing policy. So I understand from the essay that that large body of people who get involved in the development of policy who are not in government is waning a bit. Well, Scott's closing essay is worth the price of the book. With a nice economy of style, he lets the reader know that with all its flaws of costliness, legalism and dilatoriness, the public inquiry is here to stay because it fills a need in our political system. Now, I haven't mentioned all the essays by any means. Each is tremendously worthwhile. I've devoted a bit more time to the early chapters because in a sense, they reveal that a public inquiry can be a resource decades after it concluded and had unexpected benefits. What do I think is missing from this book? I'd like to have seen something on what, is there any theme about what brings about a public inquiry, be it a royal commission or the other kind? I have thought that at least in a large number of these areas, it's regulatory failure. It's the failure of oversight of the subject matter that gives rise to the inquiry. Certainly, uh, I saw that in the Racing Royal Commission, the regulatory capture of the people charged within government of overseeing the racing industry in this state had become so engaged with the dominant personalities in the racing industry that they were too timid to call them out. Not corrupt, just overborne by them. And I think it's essential that you have a chain, you know, a turnover of regulators so that this doesn't happen. And then you're less likely to have the scandals that give rise. It's, I mean, obviously it was the case in the, um, the gambling casino uh, commissions of inquiry that we've seen around the country. I do not know how the regulators ex uh, escaped a terrible denunciation by the commissioners in those inquiries, but they seem to have, um, because were they doing their job, these things couldn't possibly have happened. Supervisors in prisons, we saw in the Northern Territory that had those who were required to look out for work practices uh, in the juvenile detention centres in the Northern Territory, had they been doing their job, then these terrible events that we saw on the television Un were unlikely to have occurred. So that's that's really all that's missing from it, and perhaps that's that, that's not the kind of research that people have engaged in, but it's something to, to throw out there. So it gives me great pleasure to launch new directive directions in royal commissions and public inquiries. Do we need them? I hope that lots of copies are sold. And I hope that what's in it is heeded by governments everywhere and those who are charged with conducting royal commissions as well understand the deeply reflective uh, ideas that are contained within it. And good luck to all who sell it. <laughs>
and I've been through several floods and had to row out my grandfather from 38 Brisbane Street I have some affiliation with the, the flood, flood issue at all. So it's quite interesting. And the, the, the flood uh, Royal Commission is a very interesting one and was particularly chosen, which Margaret will explain more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I shall compete with the drill above. <laughs> In January 2011, much of South East Queensland was underwater. Brisbane was submerged 4.46 metres recorded at the Brisbane City Gauge. And four days after the peak, on the 17th of January, the Queensland Government established the Queensland Floods Commission of Inquiry. In announcing the inquiry, Premier Anna Bly declared, this is not a criticism of what we have done, it will identify what we did well and what we can do better. The inquiry was headed by Commissioner and Sitting Supreme Judge Catherine Holmes and two Deputy Commissioners, Jim O'Sullivan, who was a former Police Commissioner, and Phil Cummins, who was an engineer. An interim report was presented on the 11th of August 2011 and the final report was presented on the 16th of March 2012. I raise three issues in my chapter, and the first is highlighted by the title, which is Drowning in Data. The Commission faced, was faced with an extraordinary amount of data, and much of it was highly technical. The second thing I talk about is the role of the media in influencing the inquiry. I was interested to see that that was a point that you raised, so thank you. And third, whether a commission of inquiry was the best way to learn lessons from a flood. Now the Queensland Flood Commission of Inquiry sat for 68 days over 13 months. 345 people gave evidence and 6,133 pages of transcripts of evidence were produced. They are in fact an extraordinary historical document. The inquiry received more than 700 written submissions from experts and non-experts alike. Now these don't get the opportunity to be fact-checked by the inquiry, experts, the media, or the public, or indeed the commissioner. And as the commissioner at the time said, time did not allow that. The inquiry's focus, though I argue, soon narrowed to a forensic examination of the operation of Wagaho Dam. And this immediately, in my thinking, redirected the inquiry away from a search for answers about the flood causes that might improve future outcomes in a later flood and moved it towards a more adversarial environment, which was more focused on fault. The four operational flood engineers became key witnesses at the inquiry as their actions came under intense scrutiny. Now, all inquiries are based on uh, expert testimony, and many with legal training are adept at processing detailed evidence. But much of the data that was presented as is, at this inquiry was highly technical. It depended on scientific expertise in hydrology. And the engineers who presented for both sides found themselves hung, hamstrung by an instru instruction that they couldn't use tables and diagrams, which is their tools of trade. Instead, they had to reduce everything to words that could be understood by everybody in the inquiry. Now, lawyers are wordsmiths, engineers are technocrats. And this is just basically a cultural clash. And linguistic issues plagued, plagued the Queensland Flood Commission of Inquiry. Participants maintained that more expertise was required from practicing hydrologists which had on the ground experience. Now the Flood Commission did employ technical experts as advisors, but the process was rushed for them. For example, a key expert appointed by the commissioner was only given four weeks to prepare his report. And he didn't have the benefit of a comprehensive flood study that would take the next three years to complete. Now the issue of processing technical data became even more problematic with the dismissal of the Deputy Commissioner and Engineer Phil Cummins. 
and he was a recognised international expert on dams. But the media accused him of a conflict of interest because he had been employed by a company after the inquiry that was going to work on the Wivenhoe Dam manual. Although Justice Holmes declared that the media story was wrong, Cummins took no further part in the flood inquiry to avoid a possible perception of a conflict of interest. Now, interestingly, Justice Holmes told the media that this won't present me with any particular difficulty, but because, because the decisions I have to make are essentially about credibility. And they are not ones in which I can be helped with, with technical advice. So I'm suggesting that it's interesting that by then the emphasis had moved from a technical inquiry about how floods had caused and how we could prevent them, what went wrong and how we could do things better, to re-quote Anna Bly, to an issue about credibility. Cummins' departure, while commended in the media, was criticised by the engineering profession as many felt this left the commission devoid of the necessary expertise to understand the technical issues at hand. And this leads to my second issue, which was the role of the media. Journalist Hedley Thomas at The Australian rejected the inquiry's interim report findings. And in January 2012, he claimed that the flood engineers had breached the Wyvernhoe Dam operating manual, citing unearthed emails by engineers as his proof of a cover-up. As a direct consequence of these allegations, additional documents were sought and the inquiry reopened for 10 days, placing the flood engineers firmly in the spotlight to determine if they'd lied to the inquiry, falsified documents, and not comply with the manual. The media shaped the narrative and the inquiry moved further towards a focus on blame. Imposed gags on government employed hydrologists and other experts left journalists relied on a very, relied on a very limited supply of information to fill the news vacuum. As you said, media love uh, inquiries and it can be lazy journalism. The newspapers recirculated the same information time and time again. The dam engineers were named, their addresses published, and they were criticized and they were denied the right of reply. For some journalists, the silence became the story, as it suggested a cover-up or conspiracy. Hedley Thomas cited retired engineers not gagged by conditions of employment. Self-professed or media-labeled experts, some choosing to remain anonymous, came forward. Chemical engineer Michael O'Brien, described by the Australian as a dam expert, was frequently cited despite his lack of expertise. He condemned the dam management, later conceding that his analysis had been based on the very limited public information. A 24 hour media cycle leaves little opportunity for analysis or fact checking or retraction of inaccuracies which allowed these opinions to grow in authority. The use of spuriously labeled experts fanned unfounded media speculation and misinformation as Thomas cited an economics professor, farmers and a lawyer to challenge hydrologists. Now, it is the role of the media to critique public policy, to ask difficult questions and frame political issues. However, the media can undermine confidence in an inquiry by casting doubt on expert opinions and evidence presented, as was the case in the Queensland Floods Commission of Inquiry. Hedley Thomas repeatedly argued that the flood was an avoidable disaster, claiming prudent operation would have present, prevented most of the flooding, a theme that grew and grew in the media and among the wider public. And this, to me, highlights the need to think about the role of the media, experts, and the community in public inquiries. And finally, I ask, was a commission of inquiry the best way to investigate floods? I suggest that by come, it became an adversarial inquiry that pitted expert against expert, rather than looking for cumulative knowledge. And this retarded the flood investigation and the chance of systemic change 
By contrast, an independent inquiry supported by specialist panelists with a range of skills and expertise to interpret the technical information presented may have reached a better result. I personally think the Queensland Floods Commission of Inquiry was a missed opportunity. The inquiry could have widened its questioning to consider the role of local governments, planning laws, and ways to limit future floodplain development and reduce the hazard. Narrowing the inquiry reduced the likelihood of changing floodplain management practices and the implementation of adaptive behaviours to accommodate future floods. Lessons for the future were not learned. Instead, the inquiry reaffirmed a faith in dams if only they are operated properly. When the real problem facing South East Queensland is that many of us continue to live on the floodplain and continue to build there. Thank you. I'm sure the real estate issue would be far from the <laughs> I've spoken to them. <laughs> I, I, I have sold real estate. Um, uh, not on the floodplain. Not on the floodplain. At the time. <laughs> Thanks very much. That was fantastic. And um, it's great, great to uh, uh, see. We'll be interested to see how the, uh, the, the chair of that inquiry is also chairing the Rabo Debt Inquiry. So it's going to be very interesting to see what comes. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Annabel Wallace from UNE, uh, all the way from New South Wales. Um, and uh, her topic, her PhD was on structural reform in local government, which I think means really amalgamation, doesn't it? Right. it is, yeah. That's just another, <laughs> another <laughs> word for amalgamation. <laughs> and, we, and as you may or may not know, we shrunk in the number of local governments in Australia from about 900 or so when I went to the university to about 550 now. Um, and, and that's it's quite quite interesting. Um, and Dr. Wallace is going to talk about a particular inquiry uh, into local government in New South Wales, um, which wasn't about amalgamation, but seemed to become about amalgamation. <laughs> Over to you. Okay. I've got a bit of a heart act to follow, two, two really quite serious speeches, but um, basically in 2016, local government amalgamation, an absolute wholesale uh, amalgamation of councils across New South Wales was announced after about four years of consultation. And I use that word very loosely. In April 2012, an independent local government review panel <clears throat> was appointed by the New South Wales government. <clears throat> and it was there to provide impartial expert, and that's another sort of loaded word nowadays, an expert, uh, independent policy advice to the New South Wales state government. Now, the panel, which was this independent local government panel, it was a public inquiry. It was temporary, it was there to conduct open processes of investigation. It collected evidence, it reported its findings, and it was independent to the appointing government. But it's an interesting case study when we go into it of how a state government used an inquiry instrument and didn't really conduct their own due diligence, they simply adopted those recommendations given by the panel um, and it created an enormous amount of upheaval within New South Wales. You know, I think, again, as we've seen over these last few years of being locked down um, subject to a litany of regulations, just because something or someone is labelled expert we actually really must conduct our own due diligence. We can't believe something simply because somebody says, I know more than you. But when we come down to this whole idea of why did we have this panel there, these experts who are going to say local government's broke, local government, it has a bit of a problem in Australia 
you know, every state and territory in Australia has its own system of local government. It all operates under different legislation. But every single council in Australia faces the same challenges. Local government in Australia doesn't enjoy constitutional recognition. It's simply there at the behest of its state or territory government. And that government can forcibly amalgamate that council if it so wishes. <clears throat> so in reality, local government really is only the handmaiden of its state or territory government. It can't raise its own operating revenue um, and it's unequal <coughs> sorry, in the Australian Trinity of Government. <coughs> Thanks. Councils in Australia, they operate within this really strange paradox. So they're the third tier of government. However, they are democratic institutions. You know, they're there to represent the community. And of course, we get fined if we don't vote for them. However, they are obliged to operate like a corporate entity. Thank you. But again, when we come down to this idea that we've got this paradox of local government, it's a democratic institution, but it's also expected to operate like a corporate entity. This emphasis came from another public inquiry conducted in 1978, the Baines Report. But of course, all local government systems around the world operate like this. They're expected to, at the very least, and they're the only form of government that is expected to not spend like, you know, there's no tomorrow. But a lot of this idea that local government is, should be like a corporate entity, it's driven worldwide structural reform programs. Because everybody seems to have this erroneous idea that if we merge a bunch of councils together, create one big mega council, it's a whole heap cheaper to run. You get these things called economies of scale. Research has proven time and time again, it's actually population density, not the amount of councils you're operating under one roof. And in the sort of non-metropolitan Australia, Local government is a little bit more than roads, rates and rubbish. It is the only form of government there. And I also need to say amalgamation is really expensive. You know, we're talking not millions, but often billions when you actually start totting up the costs. So local government, it's mm -hmm. always broke, basically. It can't make any money, but it's there. So to get back to this whole idea, why was the panel appointed? If we take it at face value, which is probably not the best idea, mm -hmm. they were there to do fact finding, do some research, because a lot of the time state governments or even federal government doesn't have its own in-house research services, doesn't have that team anymore. You know, it's cheaper to simply bring people in. And also as well, there's an idea that the appointing government may want sort of public consultation. They want to see what, you know, the word on the street is. But there's always a B-side to every single thing in the world. And that appointing government often simply wants to institute a policy that is unpopular and they want to cover their tails it's much easier to blame somebody else for what you're doing than say, mea culpa, I did it. So who appointed this panel? In 2011, we got a new government in New South Wales. We got a Liberal National Coalition after 16 years of a Labour government. The Labour government had gone through a round of forced amalgamations in 2004 they were not popular. That, that is to put it very mildly. Um, they campaigned this new government on real change for New South Wales and <laughs> no forced council amalgamation. They were very, quite loud about this whole idea, we won't do this to you. And the coalition won. They won by a landslide. And so in the end though, 
the coalition looked at local government and said, hmm, there doesn't seem to be much money there. So they held this conference in Dubbo in 2011. They invited everybody from local government to come. And they said, hmm, what does an appropriate council structure look like? Of course, there was no consensus and they needed to actually get some experts in. So in April 2012, they required this coalition government said, we need some experts and they need to answer this question. What should local government look like? So they appointed the local government review panel, this independent. Now, the panel consisted of three people, Professor Graham Sampson. He was a professor of local government at the University of Technology in Sydney. Uh, he was employed by the Australian Centre for Excellence for Local Government. It's not a mouthful at all. Uh, it was a federally funded think tank. They were especially given money by Kevin Rudd in 2009. Then there was Glenn Inglis. He had been the CEO of the Tamworth Regional Council in 2004, just after that had been forcibly merged. And there was also Jude Monroe who some of you may have known as the former CEO of the Brisbane City Council. So this panel, they were put together, they were appointed, their terms of reference were made clear. I won't go through them all now because you need to buy the book and read it. It's very exciting. <laughs> but no forced amalgamations, this catch cry of their appointed government was not part of their terms of reference. That should be a big red flag, just there. However, when we look at everything and we always have 2020 vision in hindsight, good policy outcomes were thwarted by this, the panel's processes. The panel lasted, it had a tenure of 19 months. It released three reports. They held public consultation tours and hearings around New South Wales. Mm -hmm. Apparently they were given sufficient resources, but the consultation meetings weren't advertised. Jude Monroe said the panel hadn't sufficient money to notify everybody, but Sampson said they did. So who knows what went on? It's just that the ad in the newspaper for when your council could go uh, and talk to the panel Whoops, it was the day after the actual meeting. So when we look at this idea of evidence-based public policy, it, it seems to be a bit of a unicorn, really. Um, each of the panel's three reports was based upon research conducted by more experts. Uh, most of it actually came from Sampson's employer, this Australian Centre for Excellence for Local Government, or it relied upon other consultants to provide this research. A lot of the research, of course, was cherry-picked. It was artfully framed. It was chosen very nicely. But in the end, after 19 months, this panel, who was appointed by a government who said, oh, no, 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 no forced amalgamations from us. Every single council in New South Wales it was recommended by the panel, would be subject to some form of boundary change. This panel recommended amalgamation, which would cost the New South Wales taxpayer squillions, 105 out of 152 New South Wales councils. The coalition adopted these recommendations as a policy package and called it fit for the future. So, this public inquiry actually led to wholesale municipal mergers across New South Wales. And the recommendation by the panel, I may add, is exactly the same advice given in 1973 by the Barnett Committee. So there's no such thing as a new idea. And we can see this if we keep going through things all the time. But of course, implementing policy, it's can make one rather unpopular when one is in power. And there were a few things happened in 2014. We had a new premier, the Minister for Local Government was shuffled along to the side. Things started to go through, but the government was very keen to actually adopt 
this fit for the future policy. Let's just have about three councils in New South Wales sort of thing. But other people weren't terribly impressed. So in 2015, a legislative council inquiry was held as well. That led into sort of looking at the processes and implementation of the state government's policy. But it didn't really make much of an impact because in May 2016, there were 19 newly merged councils. And when we're talking about merged councils, there's four or five councils being merged into one. The result is we actually don't know and will probably never be privy to the information of how much this cost. Because as you can all imagine, merging councils is really expensive because you have harmonisation costs, you have costs of actually trying to get things done, laying off staff, but also as well, the actual inquiry itself. How much did it cost everybody to get three experts? Also as well, when we look at the outcome several years later, several of the forcibly amalgamated councils have either demerged or they are going through the process of demerging. And that again is horrifically expensive. And also as well, most of the councils that were merged are broker than they were before the merger. This was to save them money, but no, they, they actually can't afford to run these enormous councils because it's population density, not size of council that makes the difference. They've raised their rates. So it's the rate payer who's paying for things. So this in itself is an interesting case study of looking at how can we make a democratic institution operate like a corporate entity? And why are we expecting both things? But also why do we expect it from local government but we don't expect it from the other tiers of government? So just some interesting questions to finish with. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. That's really interesting, our local amalgamation. Um, our, our final member of the panel is Dr. Alistair Stark, who's a reader uh, from the University of Queensland, which he tells me is a very special University of Queensland designation. <laughs> uh, uh, very British, he tells me. And now, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Stark is from Scotland, so he's not English. So he's not no, that's it. So I want to get that right. Uh, he specialises in crisis issues. He's written quite a lot of books. He's very interested about organisational memory, how organisations forget. And I think we know governments forget things pretty quickly um, about about things. Um, and um, he's won the Henry Mayer Prize. Henry Mayer is one of the great professors of political science in Australia. Uh, for one of the best papers in the Australian Journal of Political Science. He's written several books. Um, he likes being in Queensland, he tells me, uh, he and his wife and child. Uh, uh, I have been to Scotland, that's why I, I thought uh, my mother's um, Scottish background, which I thought I did feel was, a, a, in summer, was a cold place. I thought it was freezing. Okay. Um, so over to you, Alistair. Alistair's won uh, an ARC grant on assessing the impact of royal commissions which is the, is on the big question. Now, why are they appointed? The next big question, what happens to them? Okay, have you answered. Okay, this is the uh, foreign language part of today. <laughs> I hope uh, I don't go too fast and become a bit Scottish trade unionist in my delivery. <laughs> Thanks for that introduction. I'm probably going to uh, give less answers than that they be alluded to. Um, public inquiries are fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. One of the fascinating things for me is that they exist outside the rhythm of daily political and bureaucratic life. Nowhere else in the policy world do we see sometimes multi-million dollar organisations appearing overnight, gathering together the best in the business from different professions and making them sprint to an impossible to achieve deadline, producing reports, advice and analysis. But then just as quickly turning the lights off, shutting the door, crossing their fingers and hoping an executive will respond to a report. It's a fantastically interesting 
uh, 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 institution. The other thing that interests me is their idiosyncratic nature. Even in situations where we have legislation that structures them, an Inquiries Act, a Royal Commission Act, the, the, the personality of every inquiry is completely different. The form and the functioning of every inquiry, no two are the same. But it's also the potential that's really fascinating. Each of us, we'll say nerds that study public inquiries, have our greatest hits. We can rhyme out our three favourite commissions or our three favourite inquiries which have been transformative. And we'll have our three terrible hits, the three that never done anything that are now gathering dust on a shelf. It's this potential to be forgotten or to be transformative that makes inquiry so interesting from a research point of view. Another fascinating feature of inquiry scholarship is the fact that the single biggest and most important question is the hardest to answer. It's obviously alluded to in the cover of the book. Do we need them? Uh, with apologies to the publisher, the spoiler alert is that question's already been answered. <laughs> and it's actually answered by Scott in the first few pages of the book. When we talk about the frequency of royal commissions and public inquiries across the decades, we're showing that they are inevitable. There's an inevitability to these institutions. Governments always turn towards them because they need the independence the independence of the analysis, the independence of the advice, the independence of the accountability. So, without wishing to lecture to Scott, the better question, which is actually addressed substantively in the book, is are these institutions effective? This is a crucial question. It's not merely an academic question. One of the reasons that it's crucial is because you can go into any broadsheet newspaper almost in any year, in any Westminster country, and you will find an editorial or a commentary telling you that inquiries are useless, that they spend too much money, that they gather dust on shelves, that they're manipulated by governments, and that they're ineffectual. You can go to any broadsheet newspaper in this country and you will find a commentary in this regard. What unites those commentaries is the fact that they have no evidence <laughs> underpinning them. They are exactly that, commentaries. So we have to provide evidence about effectiveness and impact. This is bloody difficult. <laughs> There's a few reasons for this. If we were to shut the doors and lock you in and torture you with the question, what is inquiry effectiveness? We would be here till sunset and we wouldn't be able to resolve that problem. The reason's been alluded to several times. Inquiry effectiveness for a journalist is very different from inquiry effectiveness for a minister. What the minister says in public about what they want from inquiry and what they say in private <laughs> is very different. And that's different, again, from somebody who's affected by floods. Uh, each constituency has a different view of what effectiveness is. And because inquiries are so different and so idiosyncratic, that debate about what they are and what they should be doing expands exponentially. It's also incredibly difficult, as I've found, to measure the outputs of an inquiry. Simply tracking a recommendation, one recommendation that's been made by a public inquiry through the different agencies of a public sector can take months. And then, what does it mean to say that recommendation has been implemented? Is there an actual outcome? A hundred recommendations could be implemented without any effect, and one can change a whole policy system. So we need to care about what's been implemented and also this intangible outcome issue. However, a final reason, and this is one that I want to dwell on, is that we also don't have enough good information that allows us to do meaningful comparisons. We have a lot of data, and there's data about specific inquiries across the scholarship, but what does it mean in terms of effectiveness? 
we can only begin to answer that question if we can compare meaningfully. So, as Scott has alluded to, I've spent some time examining every federal level royal commission in Australia since the turn of the century. I tracked every single recommendation <laughs> of every single commission that should have been implemented by 2015. It's taken a team of four, three years to do this. It's not fun <laughs> and it's not enjoyable. I can tell you that we tracked 444 recommendations to completion. I could tell you that 243 of those were not implemented. I could tell you that 166 were fully implemented and that 35 were partially implemented. But what does that mean? <laughs> Where is the meaning in those statistics? We have to go further. When it comes to outcomes, I could tell you that I interviewed a lot of people independent people who had a, a expertise in relation to the focus of each of these royal commissions. Out of the interview data, we resolved that only three royal commissions created substantive change. The Coal Commission into the building and construction industry, the Cameron Commission that examined the equine influenza epidemic, and Neville Owens Commission into the HIH collapse. But what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Are Royal Commissions effective? After spending three years of blood, sweat and tears, I'm still asking the same question. Is it the case that federal level Royal Commissions are more effective than state level? My gut says perhaps yes, but I can't be sure. Is it the case that the federal level of Australia is better than New Zealand or the UK? My gut says no, but I'm not sure. Are we doing better now in this 15 year period than previously in other decades? I'm not sure. I can't answer these questions because I'm robbed to some extent of meaningful comparisons. This is why this book is so important. And this is why if I could just praise him a little bit publicly, Scott is so important. The scholarship around public inquiries are like the institutions themselves. People come into the space, they do one or two articles, and then they go, this is bloody difficult. <laughs> and then they leave. Like the inquiry, they shut up shop, and they don't hang around. Well, Scott, I was going to say because of his tenacity, one might say stubbornness, has been here. He's hung around from the 70s. He's produced consistently state-level data, international data, meaningful uh, data across time. This gives us some ability to start to thinking about data in a meaningful sense. We need more of Scott and we need more of texts like this. Otherwise, the data that I've generated doesn't give us what we need. It doesn't allow us to answer the question. Inquiries spend millions of dollars, they end up gathering dust on some shelves, or they end up prompting billion dollar reforms. But the fact that we as scholars still can't deliver a systematic answer to whether or not they're effective isn't acceptable. And it's one reason why we see sloppy journalism and editorial commentary replacing evidence-based debate. This is why this book is so important. Scott remains the only person who's consistently provided data which allows us to challenge those editorial commentaries, providing meaning to evidence about impact, but most importantly helping us improve the public debate about inquiries. It allows me the opportunity to take my data and compare it against state level inquiries to think about whether crisis-driven inquiries are more or less effective than others that deal with more prosaic issues, to think about comparisons within and across Westminster systems. This is why we need books like this. So do we need royal commissions? It doesn't matter. They are inevitable. We have them and we'll continue to have them. 
are they effective? I think my answer to that would be royal commissions at the federal level of Australia in this century, in this period, have been profoundly ineffective. Profoundly ineffective. But I can only come to that conclusion because of a book like this, and more importantly, a body of work like Scott's, which allows me to bring meaning to my data. Books like this help us understand the crucial question of effectiveness. So like others today, I'm going to say congratulations, Scott, for bringing together a wonderful text. But I'm also going to say thank you for allowing me to make sense of my data. And I'll leave it there. Written there, I can't <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 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 I don't